afternoon. I'm Heather Worley, and I'm going to be serving as your moderator today for In the Garden. Welcome to our program. Uh, joining me are fellow master gardeners. We have Micah LaBarnes and Melissa Siegel. And we, some of the services that master gardeners in the county provide include speaking to garden clubs, and we have a speakers group. Uh, that has a number of topics um, that we uh, speak about. We have a couple of demonstration gardens. There's one in Durwood, Maryland. We have one at the fairgrounds. The fair is currently going on right now. So you, if you visit the fair, you can take a look at the Master Gardener Demonstration Garden there. And there's our volunteers out at the fair. And Melissa, I think you have um, some um, monarch caterpillars and caterpillars there, right? Yeah, I did. I brought up a plant with about 10 or 12 caterpillars on it, a milkweed plant. And the children or adults will get to see the process of them becoming a chrysalis and then coming out. Yeah, that's amazing. I was there on Saturday and um, there's also a scavenger hunt for good bugs and bad bugs. And we're going to be talking about some of those bugs today um, as we answer questions from our previous um, program. We also do youth gardening programs. So we do a lot of education, therapeutic horticulture programs. Uh, we conduct and appear at special events and um, do plant clinics at Ask a Master Gardener, just to name a few of the uh, things that we do to educate uh, you about what's going on in their landscape and how we can all work together to um, provide a sustainable um, lifestyle. So today our presenter, Michael Barnes, is going to be talking about another demonstration garden that we have, and it's the USO Demo Garden at Walter Reed Medical Center. So thank you for joining us, Michael. Thank you. And uh, let me, can you see my, uh, oh, there we go. Yes. Excellent. Finally, love when technology works. So a little background. Um, the USO was founded in 1941 to provide recreational and support activities to active duty personnel and their families. And the USO Warrior and Family Center at Bethesda Walter Reed um, here in Montgomery County was open to much fanfare in 2014. Uh, George W. Bush came, um, um, the um, Miss America came, lots of generals and admirals, um, and the Healing Garden uh, was opened and they received a grant from the Bob, Bob Woodruff Foundation. If you remember, Bob Woodruff was a anchor for ABC News that was hit by an IED in, uh, in Iraq. And he spent months at, at Walter Reed, it was Bethesda Naval Hospital then, but he spent months there um, being um, um, uh, rehabilitated. And his wife said that one of the few things that gave her solace during that time was gardening. So there's a beautiful, there was a beautiful garden there. However, though um, it was, um, um, designed beautifully and lots of flowers and lots of things, it was not kept up. And we know that gardeners, gardens without gardeners don't really fare very well. There's a deer inf infestation. So all you ended up with were weeds and, and grasses. So um, the current administration there at the USO uh, reached out to the Montgomery ba Master Gardeners and asked what we could do to help them. So a bunch of master gardeners, um, myself and my two co-chairs, uh, Yumiko and Edith, and a crew of about, and depending, somewhere between five and 20 uh, master gardeners, uh, worked on the garden to reclaim it. And true to our educational mission, we worked with corporate volunteers. There's a number of corporations that a department or something will come and want to do volunteer work at the USO. It's good for the, for the USO and it's a way to bond if you're a corporate entity. So we get a lot of, or we did pre-COVID, <laughs> get a lot of corporations coming through. These people didn't have gardening expertise, but that's where we led them and helped to reclaim the garden. Here are pictures of working on the garden. And to the right are a bunch of people with hand trowels 
and they serve a purpose. But you see to the left, our most recent corporate partner, uh, Clark Construction, actually brought earth moving equipment with them, which was extremely handy for trying to get rid of some of the more ugly and pervasive weeds and, and grasses. So um, over the, the last probably two and a half years, two of those being COVID, uh, we have managed to reclaim most of the garden. Um, some of the services we do be, uh, uh, in addition are, um, we work with the hospital recreational therapists and we, um, we're part of their psychiatric continuity services. So they have programs for active duty personnel with PTSD. And we do educational hands-on plant activities um, for this group. And to the left, you see them potting um, um, spider plants. It was a enormous spider plant, and they got to pick which one they want and put it in a pot. And to the right, cactus are very, very um, um, timely. Everybody seems to like them, and that's a terrarium they built. Um, the last one we did, I think they took herbs and made uh, tea bags out of them, um, and it's very interesting because most of these people are actually young males. I mean, we get a whole gamut of people, but um, looking for things that really will relate to them is interesting. And um, the, the licensed therapist says it really is an opener to get them to talk. And she actually does the therapy. Um, and she's been very supportive and um, eager for us to actually do more now that COVID's over. So this is um, an example of how gardens, oh, and we also tour the garden afterwards. Um, this is an example how gardening can help those with um, um, ailments of the brain and, and PTSD. But in the next one, you'll see that um, the garden, this is a, this is a picture of the garden. Um, I don't know if it's late fall or early spring, but you can see it's sort of cut back. And I chose this one because you can see some of the different landscapes. Um, it was very specifically built in the beginning um, to have different surfaces. You'll see a little bridge here that's wooden. You'll see a over here, this is like gravel dust. And over here, there's some um, bricks, and it's kind of a rough surface. And you'll see an incline over here. Um, that's specifically done so that people that are without limbs or have limited mobility um, can have a place that's sort of safe to try out their new limbs or their wheelchairs. Um, also, as gardeners, we really like things that drape out into paths. You know, it's a beautiful picture. But um, gardening in this place, we have to keep all the paths cleared for wheelchairs. And we also try to keep some of the plants lower so that those in wheelchairs can um, it's at a level they can appreciate it. So uh, so that was an interesting uh, look for a gardener like myself to see a different viewpoint. Uh, also, to our educational goals, uh, we have gone through and labeled, you see a small little label there, uh, many of the, the, um, the plants. Um, when we do tours, it's very interesting because a lot of service people come from rural areas, more so, um, obviously, we have people from cities, but they over-index to rural. And a lot of them get very, um, I've given lots of tours where the person said, I'm so excited to see this. It reminds me of my grandmother. She had a garden. And they, they want to know what it is we're, we're looking at. So, so we've done the labeling so they can um, do it on their own if they need be. And this year, when we couldn't be there for, um, for COVID, we built a little library, which you'll see there's a whole bunch of literature in there um, for those coming into the garden. And we were able to put that in just recently. Um, so here are some pictures of our garden, and um, you see the little caterpillar over there that uh, you mentioned earlier. We have milkweed in abundance, um, and if I, there's any questions, I'm happy to take those. Well, thank you, Michaela. It seems like that um, garden is very useful for rehabilitation and healing and something that... Um, Everyone, I think, has been seeking over the last few years Most in terms definitely. of coping with uh, life stresses. A lot of us do seek solace within uh, the garden itself. Yeah. 
So if you, um, do you want to keep this screen up or would you uh, like no, to I, uh, you can No, I'm done. You can take it back. So, so if you have any uh, gardening questions for Michaela about the USO garden or how you can um, help there or... Um, or if you have any questions for us as master gardeners um, regarding any of the programs that, that we've mentioned and anything we have on our website, there's going to be a link posted shortly by our um, amazing producer, Bev Carriger. And please remember to include your email in case we need to follow up with you. And you can also view previously answered questions on um, YouTube. If you search up in the garden for University of Maryland, um, it should come up. So since the last program, we did um, receive some questions that um, we're going to be addressing today. Um, and so I will be going through those. And our first question, yes, so Bev is going to have us... Um, sharing the um, submitted photos. So it's very important um, and helpful for us to diagnose the problems if um, photos are included. So the first question it has to do with a Shaflira uh, houseplant and um, what is happening to, um, Laura is who submitted this question, what was happening to her viburnum? The leaves are drying up and they were dropping off. So Laura had submitted the question. Uh, ver so Melissa will address that to, to Laura. Okay, so first it's, it's not a viburnum, it's a Schifflera. And it's a common house plant that needs the correct amount of uh, indirect sunlight and water as well. If your Schifflera is getting leggy and leaves are floppy, it's not getting enough bright light and it shouldn't be getting light directly from the sun. And these plants should also be pruned regularly so the light can reach the whole part, all parts of the plant. Some leaf drop on house plants is normal. Older plants should be expected to drop a leaf or two occasionally. But if leaves are turning yellow or falling off more than that, you're probably giving it too much water. Root rot is a common problem with these plants also due to overwatering and poor drainage. But I took a look at the stems. I noticed something different on the main trunks and some of the leaves. Um, it looked like some kind of bug. So scale, aphids, spider mites, and mealybugs are very common with Schifflera. And if any of these occur, you need to wash the affected leaves, stems, and trunks with mild soap and water. Um, if it's more serious, like we see here, you can treat the plant with neem oil. This is a tropical plant native to Australia, New Guinea, and Java, where the hardiness zones are above 10. So if you want, and it's hot and humid enough, you can keep your plant in a pot outside and bring it in as the climate cools down. Great recommendation. So thank you, Laura, for submitting that um, question about your houseplant. And I know that's a common problem with a lot of houseplants where we want to overwater and then it creates um, problems um, within the pot itself with causing root rot um, and other issues. And so thank you for addressing that question. The next question is about white spots on marigolds and squash, which I'm assuming is outside. And by the pictures, it looks like it's in a vegetable garden and submitted from uh, John in Bethesda. And he wants to know what's causing those white spots on his marigolds and the squash. Is it harmful and how can he prevent it? So when we took a look at the first photo um, in the marigold leaves, you'll see these little white um, spots. And the second picture, which has um, the squash leaves, we were able to see on the bottom, on the underside, it's great that you got an underside shot of the leaf because we could actually see little black dots um, underneath uh, the leaf. So uh, we think that it is actually thrips that are um, sucking insects that are actually eating through um, the leaf and causing those little dots to appear on the other side of the leaf. So these, um, we would need to get our magnifying glass out 
to uh, detect, you know, as master gardeners, we have, we were, when we're going in the garden, we have to look closely and um, detect what it is because thrips and aphids are very tiny uh, little insects that um, can do damage, but they're, they're small but mighty. So what we would need to do after you um, determine that it was thrips or aphids, try and brush them off the plant. If you can, you can use a paintbrush or, um, or your hand into a um, soapy water dish. Um, but uh, if they are prolific, so if they come back on the leaf, um, you can use um, uh, an insecticidal spray or neem oil as well. Make sure you always follow the directions when you are using those um, types of products. Um, but the um, thrips do have some predators, so you can also, um, when you're planting your vegetable garden for next year, make sure to include those um, plants that attract those predators of thrips and aphids, and those would include the ladybugs and uh, lace wings, and there is a minute pirate bug that will feast on thrips, um, eggs, and larvae, only in that stage though. But So if you plant uh, some flowers, herbs are always a good choice to um, include with your vegetable garden in order to attract the beneficial bugs um, that might take care of it. But at this point, just washing it off um, and uh, hoping for the best. But thank you, John, for that um, question. The next question, we're going to go back inside because I'm assuming that you would have your African violets um, inside. And this, um, we don't have a name of who submitted it, but the African violet leaves are suddenly dying and the center died out. So what is wrong and what should I do to help it? So Melissa is going to talk about that because you have lots of African violets at your house, right? Well, I don't. I have a few, but I was involved with the African Violet Club when I lived in California. And I sure learned a lot about raising and propagating African violets. So, you know, looking at your plant, the soil looks really wet. And perhaps water has splashed on the leaves, which can be a cause of leaf spots. So if you've got water on the leaves and it's exposed to sunlight while it's wet, the delicate leaves will burn and develop brown spots. Um, and if you do develop water spots on the leaves, they'll need to be removed. So avoid getting water on the plant leaves and you should always water the plant from the bottom. I have this same ceramic pot as well and I love it, but it's really difficult to know when to fill the hole on the side. It's self-watering watering pot. So um, if you get water on the leaves by mistake, remove as soon as possible with a soft dry towel. And then the tight plant centers, the rusty colored leaves, it looks like this plant has been over fertilized. African violets need fluffy, well aerated soil to thrive. Conventional soil is really too heavy for your plant's delicate roots and retains too much water. So um, and fertilizer for adequate levels of your um, oxygen to permeate the, the soil. You should change the soil to African violet potting mix and reduce fertilizer to every other watering until the plant starts to look healthy again. But I do think it's salvageable. Alpha, Af African violets generally are pretty low maintenance. They're easy to grow house plants. They're native to Africa, Eastern Africa, um, and they're America's favorite houseplant. Thank you, Melissa. So we're going to go back outside <laughs> and talking about extreme temperatures. We have stressed trees and shrubs question from Karen. And on hot days, my blueberries, um, red buds, dogwood, and the hydrangea leaves are wilting. I'm afraid they will die. So how can I help them? Uh, there is a picture of the red bud in particular that we zoned in on, um, and we think it, it's a Bytrosphaeria canker um, that could cause it to um, wilt. And that is due to extreme 
uh, stressful conditions. And so it depends on the weather that we're having with the extreme temperatures. And um, we had a recent lack of rain. I would be curious to hear back from Karen to see whether after all these soaking rains that we've had in recent days, if the if they have improved, um, but the leaves will wilt when the roots have um, trouble finding enough water to reach out and uh, extend the, the root system. So um, one of the things that you can do is mulch um, or compost around your um, plants in order to conserve soil moisture. Um, you don't want to get too close to the uh, trunk where you're kind of smothering out the um, the air. You want to give some room around the base of the um, plants and um, monitor for water. So um, then there's also another question about a red bud as well. Um on the uh, draft red bud that's branching out at the bottom. So, Melissa, you know about this plant, the red bud, was it branching I out? I do, yes, they're suckers and I, I can't actually see where they're coming from. They're not coming from underneath the ground. So it must be a grafted plant. And usually the dwarf red bud is, um, is uh, grafted. And if you look at the stem, I don't think you can see the stem on that picture, but it flowers all the way down to the ground. It's very cool. Mm -hmm. And um, they're, uh, they're a specialty plant. Anyway, um, I was trying to figure out how to get rid of the, um, the, the, the growth. Do I use a scissor? Do I use a clipper? Um, what would you use? Um, I, it depends on the um, width of the branches at that point. I guess you would need a tool that would go through and give you a clean cut. Um, so pruners maybe. Yeah. yeah. But I yeah. Just somebody using a pruner and um, that looked like the great way to go. I just don't want to get infection in there. You know, if you cut it, you leave a little opening. Mm -hmm. True. True. Make sure that you're um, cleaning your pruners and your tools and disinfecting in between use because um, we don't want to spread um, any bacteria or viral or fungal diseases through our tools. So you can use a bleach solution um, and make sure that you're disinfecting in between. And But you're right, when you do prune, it leaves uh, the opening. So um, in order to protect that, but I, or you could like enjoy the little, little sprouts and let them, <laughs> let them go. Well, but I understand if you want to, to prune and uh, make it uh, the shape that you want it so that the main growth will have um, all the energy it needs. It looks like it looked pretty though, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, but it's probably not healthy for the, for the plant to keep it. The plant. Okay. All right. The next question we have is a Korean spice viburnum and wanting to know what is wrong with it. How can I help it? So, Melissa, you are going to address this one as well. This is one of my favorite plants, too. Um, it looks like leaf curl which is caused by aphids and is not particularly damaging except for the visual you're seeing. Usually happens near the tips of the branches, but it can occur, occur further down the plant. Applying neem oil is a good bet to get rid of the aphids, but by the time you go to do that, the aphids will be gone. And um, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, you can prune the affected tips of the branches and dispose of those leaves properly. Uh, my favorite characteristic of this Corian spice viburnum is that the scent that comes from the flowers. It is fabulous and it's a wonderful plant near the front door and it offers a great display of fall color. Wonderful. So it's not a, not a big deal. Just make sure you, you're, you have it under control. Excellent. The next question we have is about a black currant and uh, they have a lot of holes in them. Is there any way I can stop it? So our experts think that this is a late season caterpillar, second generation. And so it's uh, probably not going to continue to occur. It's the end of the season. So um, you can uh, 
continue to keep it there or get those disinfected pruners out and uh, just prune off the um, branch and then wait for uh, next year's uh, uh, crop of black currants as they come out. Great. And the blueberry, we have blueberry leaves that are turning yellow with green veins. Some of the leaves are turning red. What's wrong and how do I stop this? Melissa, what do so, you um, it looks like I, I think it's a nutrient deficiency. Um, it's intervening yellowing and it's caused by iron deficiency. And the soil probably has a high pH and that makes the blueberry plant unable to use the iron, causing a lack of chlorophyll uh, production. You could start with a foliar iron spray uh, for now, but then do a soil test for the pH. And you can get them at garden centers. And also the University of Maryland Extension has a great bit of information in the home and garden center with, with actual pamphlets that you can download at teaching you how to do your own um, soil test and what you should do based on what it tells you. There's, um, there's probably many types of sulfur products on the market and the best um, chloro chlorosis treatment for blueberries depends on the soil pH. It depends on the moisture timing and also start with the soil test first and then you'll find out what to do at that point. So that's what I think it is. Great. Yeah, and that's one of the recommendations that we have before you start a vegetable garden or yeah. um, if you have uh, other issues is finding out what is in your soil, what nutrients you do have that the plants require. And if you want to um, have a particular plant grow that needs a, a pH in a certain area, also performing a pH test to make sure that you're giving the, the nutrients um, necessary for the plant to thrive. You know, um, a couple of years or years ago when we became master gardeners, we used to carry those with us and to plant clinics, the uh, bags to do the soil test in. Mm -hmm. We don't do that anymore, but like I said, University of Maryland Extension has great information. Mm -hmm, for sure. So there is a um, boxwood. We have boxwood branches that are dying and they're turning brown. What is wrong and how should I treat it? So Michael is actually going to talk about what we thought was happening with this boxwood. Sure. Um we think it's either uh, volatella blight or boxwood blight. Unfortunately, both are um, can be common. Um, it's likely volatella blight as the leaves, uh, while they brown, they didn't fall off. The browning and then falling off of the leaves is a, a sign that it's likely not. Uh, if they fall off, it's likely boxwood blight. So um, with volatella blight, the leaves turn a tan straw color or bronze uh, in the spring, and then they die. Um, and under wet conditions, the, the foliage can have a mass of this pink or salmon colored spores on them. Uh, and also the dead branches have like loose bark. To treat the disease, you wait till you get dry weather <laughs> and you can prune those branches off. And you should also prune to thin the boxwood, um, but regardless of, of whether it's diseased or not, boxwood should be pruned occasionally so that you can get air in because that actually helps prevent you from getting diseases. It makes the, the plant healthier and uh, you can get ahead of it. But um, so regardless, pruning and, and, and letting air through is a good idea. So when you um, when you make when you do that, you should remove all the dead leaves and fallen um, from the from the plant. Um, and in the spring or fall, you can apply fungicide to protect the new growth the next season. Uh, you should do this and make sure that you you get it on pretty well on top of the leaves, under the leaves. Um, you know, uh, make sure you you get that pretty um, well covered. So boxwood blight is kind of similar. Um, it, it, it appears a little bit the same. And some of the, um, the what you do it for it is, is somewhat similar, though not identical. With that, you have, instead of the pink spores, you sometimes get 
small black streaks uh, uh, on the stems. And um, you, with boxwood blight, the spores can stay in the soil. Um, long distance uh, propagation of it usually comes in the form of the pathogen moving through infected nurseries. And um, if it's boxwood blight, you need to remove it if it's really damaged. You need to pull the whole, th the whole plant out. And um, the, the sticky spores of the pathogen are readily spread on clothing or on uh, your tools. So again, as we said earlier, make sure you disinfect your tools. You don't want to have cut something and carry it to the next plant and carry that disease with it. So you have to be very uh, careful with that. And when uh, you take it out, would you put it in the compost pile or would you no, put it in the trash? No, throw it in the trash. Just don't don't attempt to to you know uh, to compost it. There's some studies that show that even uh, really high temperature um, uh, composting won't get rid of that. Right. So be very very um, strict about putting that in the trash because uh, you don't want to like scrub somebody else's mulch you know, post either. Right. Um, and again, you should thin them and uh, apply the fungicide similarly to what I described before. So then the question becomes, how do I determine which it is? So there's an interesting um, little diagnostic test. You can play detective. So you should cut off the infected area, put it in a plastic bag, put a little bit of water in it and put it in a, uh, put it away in a, uh, a warm place. Come back, you know, day or so, two days later and look to see if you have pink stuff in it. <laughs> if you have pink stuff in it, <laughs> it's the volatella blight. So that's a way to tell which it is. And good luck, because boxwoods are the backbone of lots of gardens. Mm -hmm. And when you buy them, make sure that some of them are resistant to boxwood blight. Yeah. Good. Buying resistant um, varieties is one of those techniques that we recommend if you're using the um, IPM, as we call it, or integrated pest management and having the plant in the right place and selecting those varieties are one of the strategies that you can to have success with your garden. So that is great. Thank you, Michaela, for giving us that um, suggestion on uh, how to find out the difference between volatella and the boxwood blight. And we've I've seen a lot of talk on social media and um, in some next door neighbor conversations who uh, some of our neighbors are getting bitten um, uh, and don't know what's happening. Um, so the University of Maryland has a few entomologists um, that answered what is going on, Dr. Mike Rupp and Dr. Paula Shrewsbury. And if you go to our Facebook Book feed for the Montgomery County Master Gardeners, you can go back and take a look at um, their videos and the picture of what is actually going on. So, Michaela, I'm sorry that you are a victim of this as well, I heard. I, I am. I, I am. I'm, I'm recovering from oak leaf itch mites is what the common term is. Um, the Latin biological term, which I'm sure I will butcher, but I'll try anyway, <laughs> are uh, pimote hersey. And um, the, the bad news is that the cicada, the brute 10 cicadas in their own way are not done with us yet. That, in fact, what's happening is that those oak leaf itch mites are going after the eggs that the cicadas laid. All those cicadas you saw were frantically laying eggs in the branches of trees. So the oak leaf itch mites got a surprise this year. They get it every 17 years where they, um, they have more food. That's one of the things they eat. So they've been on a rampage eating the eggs of the cicadas. And they even talk about the mites raining down from the oak, leaf, oak trees. Um, as Dr. Rupp said, don't have any picnics under oak trees for a while. And the, um, 
the indication of them is, is that you get bites on the top, on your shoulders, on your head, on your neck. Uh, it's the upper body. And I can tell you from my experience that they can get fairly large um, circles of, of irritation. Uh, and they take between 10 days and two weeks to go away. They stick around for a long time. Um, but the good news is that they're going to be mo nearly gone, mostly gone by the end of this month. Those eggs will be done hatching, going to the ground, burrowing in deep to, to suck the, the, um, the, uh, the tree roots and wait for another 17 years to come back as cicadas. So once the food's gone, the mites are pretty much, you know, they're there, but not nearly in the, the numbers that we're seeing them right now. So the they're, oak, they're soon to be gone. So the oak mites are feasting now and they'll have a famine as soon as the... Uh Yes, <laughs> they have to go back to their regular fare, which is much less prolific. Yeah, yeah Doctor Rout, he said that they put a protein um, within underneath your cuticle, and that is what causes the itch. And try not to scratch it, to because that could introduce other bacterial infections. So yeah, but it you just kind of have to wait it out unless it's a really bad infestation. Uh, you know, definitely seek doctor help if you um if it's particularly bad um case that you have so all right well the cicadas and um i saw a lot of trees this year too that was also if you've uh, maples in particular that had dead dying branches from um the eggs laying in in yes. there so yeah i did some pruning uh recently because I just couldn't look at them <laughs> anymore. <laughs> as long as there, as the tree is is um, not tiny, it will be a um, cosmetic issue, right. not really a a threat to it uh, surviving. Right. Um, but yeah, they 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 do have that. It's called flagging, and you see it all around the neighborhoods. Right. So hopefully they'll survive for another seventeen years. All right. Well, thank you, our experts today for answering questions. So if you have other questions that we can answer, uh, remember, if we don't get to them, um, we will follow up with an email. Um, so go to the link that um, is posted for goumd.edu in the garden. Please enter as much detail as possible, and the pictures are fabulous. They help us determine what could be going on um, or what the issue is. So there is a deadline. There's the cutoff for the inclusion. The next session of In the Garden is going to be Tuesday, August 31st. It's at 12 noon, and those questions will be answered on our next program um, of In the Garden on Facebook Live on September 7th. So um, we'll make every effort um, to answer your questions on air. And, uh, but if we run out of time, we'll follow up. And so Michael has uh, her, her cat. So we have some he um, healing pets as well in, in the garden. Uh. <laughs> so send in the comments, um, uh, your questions. And thank you so much for joining us today, for being our experts. And we do have a lot of people working behind the scenes who have done research on the questions that you've sent in for us. So this week, the researchers were Mary Lou and Barbara, Susan, Sheila, Melissa, and Mary. So it's quite a team effort that we have going on and um, uh, sharing uh, the knowledge that we have and uh, doing some research and uh, using our resources. And uh, like Melissa said, the University of Maryland website for gardening has a ton of resources to assist you with um, your gardening needs. Um, Melissa, <laughs> do you want to say anything about um, 
Montgomery College courses, or is that yeah, time? I just not- um, wanted to say that that was one of the most important things I did as a master gardener. It taught me how to diagnose pests and um, how to identify every kind of plant that we have in our environment here. And I can't recommend it enough. If you go to Montgomery College Landscape Technology Department, there's all kinds of classes. Um, the one that I found most helpful was... Um, let's see, plants number one and plants number two. And I really liked the first one because I learned about all of the um, evergreens. I moved here from the desert and I'd never been around evergreens like this. And I couldn't decipher between them. They all looked the same to me. So um, that was a great class for me. And there's all kinds of uh, IPM classes. They have a greenhouse. You get to volunteer in there. Um, It's just a great, great place to study plants. It's great. Yeah, that would be awesome if you want to find out more information and um, learn more about what's happening uh, around your landscape. And if you need healing and more information about the USO garden, um, please, you can submit those questions as well um, that Michael will address um, and would love to see you in the garden there, right? All right, our next program will be September 7th at noon. Thank you all for joining us. Stay out of those oak trees. (laughs) Bye.